All right, guys, picking up where we left, we were talking about floating point types. There's one called float, there's another called double. Stick to double. Why? It's far more precise. You can have 15 significant digits as opposed to only six significant digits. So for example, if you have a decimal point followed by numbers, you could have a decimal point followed by 15 numbers, right? As opposed to only point, decimal point with six numbers after it. Also far, far, far larger, right? 10 to the 38, in other words, 3.4, you know, three followed by 38 zeros for a float. 10 to the 308, in other words, three followed by 308, right? So I demonstrated floating point error when we added 0.1 to itself 10 times. I believe I did that. We can check that real quickly by going back in the lecture E. Right. See, we took point one. We added to itself 10 times. And then we find out, sadly, that point one added to itself 10 times does not equal 1.0. Even when you're using doubles. However, when you're using doubles, it's a much smaller error. So what do you have to do if you want to compare a double, some kind of floating point value, to see if it's equal to something? Say somehow you calculate that density through some equation, right? Oh, I should start a new lecture. Let's do that. Anyways, what you got to do is you got to compare it to a range. If density is supposed to equal 10.1, but it actually equals 10.09, all right, they're not going to equal each other, so you're not going to your if statement's not going to work correctly. However, you, you can compare it to an acceptable error, and if it's less than that acceptable error, then you're good to go, right? So say we had some cool formula that resulted in a density equal 10.09. And this is a double, so double density equals 10.09. But we want to see if it's equal to 10.10. .10. So if I did this, if density equals 10.10, .10, it doesn't equal 10.10. .10. The if block will never trigger. So here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna declare a variable called target. This is our target value, right? Double target equals 10.1. Now, we're gonna see if we're close enough. So the difference is equal to the math.absolute value of the density minus the target. And I forgot that it's called FABS, right? Apparently it's not even called that. What have I done? All right, I was wrong. It's not FABS. That must be a different language. Maybe C++, I'm not recalling. Anyways, math.abs with a capital M takes the absolute value. If you remember your math, that means turn it into a positive number. So we take the difference between the two and we check to see if it's less than an acceptable error. So double acceptable underscore error equals 0 0.1, right? If they're within that close, then it's acceptable, right? So if the difference is less than or equal to the acceptable error, then we're good to go. Density is correct, whatever we wanted to print here, right? Density calculated correctly, in parentheses, 
encode in parentheses semicolon. Ah, let's make sure it works. Hammer and broom. Green arrow. And I'm assuming it'll actually run. Yep, and the density was calculated correctly. What if it's more? Right? What if we said that it has to be within 0.01? Let's find out if it is. It is. What if it had to be within 1 1,000th, 0 0.01, 0 0.001? It is not. It didn't print out an acceptable, you know. So it was close enough, right? Density was calculated correctly because it was close enough. It was within 1% of the expected answer. Hope that makes sense. So this is a pretty long variable name here, this acceptable error. There's two names for it if you go in and Google this up. Tolerance is one. Epsilon is another if we feel like using Greek letters, right? I'm going to go for tolerance just because it's a little bit shorter. Hopefully, it's just as under, understandable. So, the key takeaway is do not use equal equal to compare a floating point to a target because if there's any floating point, if there's any rounding error at all, then it will not work. So instead, you subtract it. Now, we could have shortened this, right? into a single step. We did not necessarily have to have this diff here. If we wanted to rewrite it a little bit, here's what we would do. We would take this statement right here, cut that expression, and paste it there. Then we could get rid of that, right? Clean up a little bit. So if the math dot absolute value of the density minus the target. Something's looking wrong there. I think I need a Nope, that's good. Is less than or equal to the tolerance, then it's close enough, right? Close enough. Density calculated correctly. Make sense? All right. Keep going. Assignments between different types. You can go from a less specific type to a more specific type just fine. 1,000 is an int, but you can store it in a double. No problem, right? There's nothing wrong because a double can hold a number as large as a thousand, right? It can hold a number with 308 zeros following it. How about if you did this? How about if you took this number right here, 26.7, that double, and you try to store it into an int? Well, if you've taken C++, you may have been used to the fact that that could work, but it would convert it into an int on the way. It would truncate it, meaning it would lose everything after the decimal point, and it would just put 26 into int. Well, Java is pickier about that. It doesn't want you to do that accidentally. So if you needed to convert 26.7 into an int, there's a specific thing you can do. It's called casting. So say my value, I have a value stored as a double, and it's equal to 10.1. And I want to store it into an int. Int i equals d. Well, that's a syntax error. See? Got the red. Oh, and while I'm thinking about it, I'm going to remove the package statement. And I'm going to click the error, fix it, move the class to the correct folder. All right. A little bit of cleanup. Right. Anyways, let's go down here. This isn't going to work because you can't store a double into an int cleanly. There's the possibility of data loss. It may be too large, right? An int can only go up to about two bit and it could not hold a number, you know, that uh, with 308 zeros after it. It could also not hold anything with a decimal point because int means whole number. So our error is incompatible types. Possible lossy conversion from double to int. What does lossy mean? Well, it would lose its dot one, right? It would only equal 10 when it was copied in there. 
or if it had 308 zeros in it, the data would be pretty much completely corrupted by the time we try to store it into a little bitty old app. But we can tell it, yeah, it's okay. I want you to store it into an end anyways. Now in Python, you do it like that. If you've ever taken Python, you recognize that very well. Not in this language. Also, that works in C++. Here's how you do it in Java. That's called a cast. Take D and cast it into an int. Well, what's a cast? Like if you're a metal worker, right? You're making a lead statue or whatever. You can make a cast so that you pour the metal into it and it forms the shape of the sculpture. Well, this takes those bits, forms it in the shape of an int. It does lose the decimal point. And if this number was too large, you know, like it was, um, you know, larger than two billion, then it would be corrupted. But it would work. So let's print out the results. System.out.printf, parentheses, percent f for the floating point value, percent d for the integer, backslash n because we like to go to the next line, int quote, comma, d, comma, i. Let's just confirm that we did wind up with the change to the data. So if I run it, here's our output, right? Here's what it started off as, 10.1. Here's what it wound up after the cast. So we did lose some data. That's why it warned us about possible lossy conversion. And what if this was much too large, right? What if this was, you know, 6E23, right? That's far too large to store into an int, which can only go up to 2 billion. You know, this is a 6 followed by 23 zeros. It's incredibly large. So if we run it, what do we see? This very large number, and it got totally corrupted when it was stored in that end. And that's our fault, right? It's our fault. We told the Java compiler that it was okay to do it. So maybe we should have checked D against the maximum value of an integer, which you can get. And if it was too large, then print out an error message. Otherwise, go ahead and do the cast. But it's totally okay to go the other way, right? If I say i equals, you know, like that, and then I want to store it in d, no problem, right? Because this itty bitty int is going to fit into that double just fine. No possible data loss. So we don't even have to do this. You could, right? There's nothing wrong. We're doing it that way. But there's no need to, right? Because the conversion will happen automatically. It'll happen cleanly without data loss. So the compiler doesn't flag it as an error. So trying to store even 0.0, .0 into count is an error if count was defined as an int. Why? Because it's got a decimal in it. And when the compiler is figuring out what's going on, it doesn't check to see the value to see whether there's a point zero or not and then allow it under certain circumstances and then not under other circumstances, right? Because if I went back here and I edited this to say 0.0, .0 the compiler doesn't know magically that this ends in dot zero and so it kind of looks like an int. So it's going to flag this as an error anyways. I'm going to undo that though because I kind of liked and let's, let's make it, you know, something easy to see. 3.14159. There we go, right? Or even math.py, right? Then when it gets converted to an int, it's going to lose, you know, the decimal point and everything after that. It turn 3.14 just into 3. So constants, any number that is coded directly into the program is known as a fixed value or a constant. It's also known as a literal. So when I'm looking at my code here, this number is literally typed into the code. So it is a numeric constant. You have to edit the code to change it. Now normally when people, when programmers think of a constant, they think about using a keyword that forces it to be a constant. And if you've taken Python, there was no such keyword, but if you've taken C++, you've seen a keyword that did it. In Java, 
it is called final. That's the keyword. Say that there was a maximum number of files I could open. Final int max underscore files equals 10. My program can open no more than 10 files. Well, by sticking the word final on it, I mean that later on, that can't change, right? If later on I try to say, well, I've improved my system, I can open 20 files. Too bad, the compiler's not gonna work. Why? Because that saves yourself from accidentally changing a value that you meant never to be changed. By sticking the word final on it, you mean, well, this is its final value, right? Is this your final answer? Yes, it is. I do not want that value to change anywhere in my code. And so later on, if you accidentally do, like if you forget that max files indicated a constant, you try to change it, it catches that error. So declaring a value that is a constant as a final value, that's a very good thing. So this is an error because max files was declared as a constant. Max files is declared as a constant, so cannot be reassigned. Sure, you can always open the program back up and change it, right? So this is a literal. That's not a literal, that's a variable, right? This is a literal. This is a named constant. This doesn't have a name, right? It's just a number 10. A literal is an unnamed constant, whereas a named constant is a value that has been stored into a constant variable, one that cannot be changed later once it has been assigned. There's a literal. This is a literal. It doesn't really look like one. It looks like a string, right? But it's literally typed into the code and if I had a typo in it and I wanted to fix it, I would have to open the code back up and change it, right? So that's also a literal, it's just a string literal. Whereas this is an integer literal and somewhere I had some floats. That's a floating point literal. So the default type for a floating point constant is double, not float, just to encourage you to use doubles throughout. Well, what does that mean? If I did this, D is still a double, right? And I typed in 3.1. This is actually a double. It's not a float. Why is that important? Well, what if for some dumb reason I actually wanted to use a float? And I said that float F is equal to 3.1. Again, it's going to flag that as an error. Why? Because this is actually a double. Literal floating points are doubles, unless you add an F to the end, right? If you add an F to the end, you tell the compiler that no, this is a floating point value. And why do you do that? Because it has to do a check to make sure that this number is small enough to float into an if, right? So if we have 3.1 exponent 100, this is too large to be a float because the float can only go up to the exponent 38. And so that's my error. It's telling me floating point number too large. Can't be stored into an F. It's trying to save me from my own dumb mistakes. So I'm gonna fix it. So that's not an error. All right, there we go. F means the unnamed constant, the literal, is a float and not a double. Double is the default type for floating point unnamed constants. How about ints? Well, the default data type for an int is just int, not a long. So again, we're back to the point where, by default, you should use ints unless it needs to be above 2 billion or below minus 2 billion. And if it has to be a floating point type, just use double. So a named constant, when you create a variable, like speed of light, well, the speed of light does not change. So you give it the final keyword so that later on, if you or some other programmer decides that you're gonna modify the speed of light, well, your program was already using speed of light, 
as a particular value and you marked it as final, you marked it as constant, so it'll, the compiler will throw up an error if you try to change it. Two main benefits of using name constant. It leads to code that is more understandable. And if a programmer ever needs to change a named constant's value, the change is easy. You find the named constant and you change its value. So there's a density formula called the ideal gas law. And it looks like this. Yeah. Oops, not a density formula. It's the ideal gas law. But anyways, the pressure is equal to the number of moles. What are moles? Anyways, we're going to go with n times a value times the temperature in Kelvin. So I'm just going to make up a number divided by the volume, like say two liters. All right. So that number looks pretty weird. And if we didn't know anything about chemistry or physics, we might not recognize that. It'd be far better to store that in a constant. Now, why did I put that in as a comment? Just because I haven't declared n, right? And 300 would be the temperature, right? So anyways, what I would want to do is I would want to declare r, that's the name of the constant, and people recommend that you capitalize your constants just to flag them as such. Right, and so then I can put that into my formula. Right, n times r times temperature divided by two. Much better, except for the fact that I have some kind of error here. That's because this is not the correct keyword, that's the C++ keyword. Keyword in Java is final. So there we go, right, this is a lot cleaner. Oh, and heck, let's go ahead and finish this. Right, double T equals 300, right, double N equals, you know, two, whatever. And this is in moles, like, like you care, and this is in Kelvin. There we go, right. So now we can actually calculate it. All right, so if it turned out later that we had been using 0 0.0821 throughout our code, 20 different places and we needed to change it to be more precise that's not as precise value we'd have to you know either do a search and replace and find every example of that and change it or we'd have to you know find them manually and change them and what if we made a mistake and miss one of them or what if we transpose two of the digits no it's far better to make it a constant so that its behavior is predictable so that if you ever need to change it then you just have to change it in one place because I could be calculating the pressure 20 times in a row in this program. And I wouldn't want to make any mistakes in it. If I need to make it more precise, honestly, I don't remember what the precise value of R is. So Googling it up, this is the value of R, right? I wasn't nearly precise enough. 0 0.082057. So that's what I should have done. I should have declared R as that. 82057. 82057. Oh, now it's far more precise, right? And this is the ga ideal gas law constant. And what if we were going to calculate something else? E equals mc squared, where m is mass measured in some units, I don't remember what, and c is the speed of light. Well, the speed of light is 3.0 something or other. So the speed of light is 2.998 to the exponent 8. Well, if I just threw that into an equation, you might not recognize what it was, right? But if I do this, final speed underscore of underscore light equals 2.998 exponent to the 8, right? Like that. And what data type is that? That's a double. Right, there we go. Now if I have an equation, right, double E is equal to whatever M is, you know, three times the speed of light squared. So math.pow 
feed underscore of underscore light comma two because that means square. All right, so that's E equals MC squared. It's far better to have that than just to have some number appear in the middle of your code, right? 2.998 e exponent A. You might not recognize that, but I certainly know what speed of light means. If I was going to do this in real life, I'd probably say E equals MC squared, just to indicate what I was doing down here, right? And I would store that three in an M variable, right? So that it'd look more like that m times c squared, whatever. We know what that means. All right, so use constants when it's a number that shouldn't be changed or when it represents you know, a constant, mathematical constant that you find in math or physics or chemistry or whatever. It's the proper way to do it. And really, the proper way to do it would probably be to define all these up at the top, right? I should copy and paste these and put them up at the top of main. Don't think I'm going to do that, but I should. If I was going to make the program easy to modify, then the very first thing I should see when I open it is a list of all my constants and some comment as to what they are, and then I already have a good idea of what this program is about. Right, so if I do final tax underscore rate Midwest City, it's a bit much, right, but anyways. And it's of type double, so final double tax rate Midwest City is equal to, I think it's 9.25, I could be wrong about that. And then I need to change that into a percentage, so dot zero, 0.925, believe that to be the tax rate. But anyways, now when I open the code, I know what that is. And now I know when I'm looking at the code, if I want to put in a new tax rate, I can change it there. Maybe adding Midwest City is a little bit too specific, so I'm going to take that off and just make it final double tax rate. Right. Then later on, if I need that value, right, if I need to change it, if our total per, total purchase, right, or let's say cost is equal to, you know, and I bought $100.50 worth of stuff, and then my total would equal cost times one plus tax rate. That's how you calculate tax rate. Or I could split that up into several calculations. I'm going to redo that a little bit. I'm going to say tax because when you look at your receipt you like to see the tax rate as a separate item on it. So the tax is equal to the cost times the tax rate and then the total is equal to cost plus the tax. There we go. Same calculation, I just broke it out into an additional step to make it even clearer perhaps, right? And it's nice to see that number there expressed as a named constant. Makes the formula easier to read. Also choosing good variable names makes the formula easy to read. If that was just x1 and then the total was called x2, the density was called x3, and the target was called x4, right? It'd be a nightmare to try to figure out what it was doing. Okay, so scrolling back down here. So if the programmer ever needs to change a named constant value, the change is easy. You just find it at the top of the method and you change its initialization value. So arithmetic operators. This is like the easiest part because we already know arithmetic. We know addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. However, there's one trick, and that one trick is that if you do division, its behavior depends upon what are known as the operands. What are operands? They're the pieces of data on either side of the symbol. So if I say int, yeah, I'm just going to use x1 even though I said not to do that, is equal to 2 times 3 times is the operator, multiplication is the operator, and two and three are operands. Operands are the pieces of data that the operator uses. When you use division, the data result is based upon the operands, whether they're integers or doubles, because an integer divided by an integer is just an integer. It's what it equals. 
I'll show you what I mean. System.out.print ln parentheses. Let's print out three divided by four. So three slash four close parentheses semicolon. If I run it, I have C.75, right? Because three divided by four is 0.75. Uh-oh, it equals zero. Three divided by four is zero. Well, in what universe does three divided by four equals zero? Well, in the Java universe, in the C universe, C++ universe, C sharp, whole bunch of languages, but not Python. If you divide three by four, it results in zero. Why? Because three is an integer, four is an integer, so both operands are integers, and if both operands are integers, then the result is also an integer. And could you store dot seven five into an integer? Is that a whole number? No, so it would round it down. It would so-called truncate it. It would lose everything after the decimal point. So dot seven five becomes zero. So this presents, this prints zero because three and four are both integers. And in Java, an int divided by int gives you an int. Meaning that the result is truncated, which means rounded down. Everything after the decimal point disappears. And that is real important, isn't it? If you used a formula and you said, you know, x is equal to 3 times 4, or 3 divided by 4 times something, right? And it said that 3 divided by 4 was 0, your formula is not going to work. So one of them would need to be a double if we wanted to get it correct. One or both of them. If we do this, 3.0 divided by four, now it really does print 0.75 because one or both of the operands are floating point types. So it does not round out. So it prints 0 0.75 because one of the operands is a float it's actually a double. It's a floating point type. So it doesn't do integer division. It does floating point division. Hope that makes sense. Closing files, I closed the wrong one. Let's see where I was. Let's just look up in the vision and we'll take it straight to it. Alright, so math operators. Otherwise, there's no surprises. If you add two numbers together and they're regardless of whether they're integers or doubles, you're going to get a reasonable result. 5 plus 3 is A. 5.0 plus 3 is still A, but it's actually equal to 8.0 because if one of the operands is a float, then the result will be a float. If one of the operands is an integer, or both of the, excuse me, both of the integers, both of the operands are integer types, whether they're ints or longs, the result is going to be an int or long. So 9.0 divided by 4.0 would get you 2.25. But if you made 9 divided by 4, it's not letting me edit it. Oh, there it goes. Then we're good to go. Well, we're not good to go, right? Because then it just rounds it down to 2, right? 9 divided by 4 is 2 with no decimal point because these are both integers. So that has some uh, important things to note. If you're writing an equation, don't store all your data in ints if there's going to be division involved. Probably ought to store them in doubles anyways. But if I did this, int mass equals three, int volume equals four, and then I said 
doesn't matter whether I said int or double, but if I said int density equals mass divided by volume, density is already defined. Okay, fine. No matter what it's defined as, it's now equal to zero, because three divided by four is zero. Give me a warning over here, the assigned value is never used. Yeah, whatever. S say we print out density afterwards. Just trust me on it. At this point, density is zero. So I should have stored mass or volume or both of those in doubles, right? So mass two is equal to three, volume two is equal to four, and then I say density is equal to mass two divided by volume two. Now the density is back to 0 0.75. So in general, if I'm doing any kind of math problem, any kind of physics, any kind of chemistry, I'm gonna make the data types double to prevent integer division from being a problem. Subtle point. Well, that's an int. So aren't you going to still have the same problem? Three divided by four? No, because they were stored into doubles. So that is a double. And that is a double, so it's not going to do integer math, regardless of whether the data started off as a whole number or not. So they say that if you do floating point division, they call it calculator division because that's how a calculator works. You type in three divided by four, you get 0.75. So the book calls it calculator division, but it's floating point division. What do you know? That's what they called it on the next slide. I have a beef about how this is expressed. Oh, there it is. It's not very clear. They follow two with a dot to indicate that it's a float. This makes it a little bit more clear, right? So if you have this expression, 13 divided by 2.0, what's actually happening? Well, you have mixed types. That's an int and that's a double. They have to be changed so that they are the same type. We don't change them, but the compiler and the Java virtual machine does. So, is it going to turn them both into ints? No, that would be dumb because what if it was 2.1? You can't turn that into an int. Well, you could cast it, right? But then something could get lost. But anyways, what the compiler is going to do is it's going to look at this and go, well, you have an int, you have a double. They need to be of the same type before I can do the math because the chip will only handle math types of the, you know, operations of the same type. So, it so-called promotes 13. Why is it called promoting? Because 13, because a floating point data type is better than an int. You have kind of a hierarchy where int is at the bottom, right? Because it's the least precise and it holds the least amount of data. Above that are longs, above that are floats, and above that are doubles still. Now, if you took a float and you stored it into an int, that's demoting it. And the compiler would not do it unless you cast it. But if you have an expression and you have an operator like that, and they are of mixed types, then the lesser, the weaker, the less accurate value is promoted to match the higher operand, the stronger operand, the higher hierarchy operand, the more precise one. So this int would be promoted to be a double in order for that math to occur. So nine divided by two is equal to what? This is grade school division. What? Well, grade school was a long time ago, so I don't remember grade school division giving you 4 if you took 9 divided by 2. But whatever, 9 divided by 2, the quotient is 4, with something left over. What is that something? Well, that's what modulus gives us. 9 modulus 2. Well, that means 2 goes into 9. How many times? Well, it was 4 times. And the remainder was 1, right? 2 goes into 9, 4 times with a remainder of 1. Yeah. Well, how many times does 15 go into 5? 15 is larger than 5. It's going to go in 0 times with a remainder of what? 15. 
10 modulus 10, right? Excuse me, that was supposed to be a 10. 10 goes into 10 one time, but it goes in cleanly with no remainder. So that's a remainder of zero, right? 10 goes into 10 one time with no remainder. So 10 modulus 10 is zero. What about 11 modulus 10? Well, 10 goes into, come on editor, stop giving me grief. 10 goes into 11 one time with a remainder of one. How about 12 modulus two? Well, you know the pattern now. 10 goes into 12 one time with a remainder of two. That's all modulus means. Modulus means remainder. Let's prove that. Let's go back into our code. And we're going to print out system.out.println 12 divided by 10, which is just 1. Right? Or 19 divided by 10. Still just 1, right? Because it rounds it down because these are both integers. You don't see any decimals anymore. Then I'm going to take that data and I'm going to do modulus on it instead. And so 10 goes into 19 one time with a remainder of 9. So I'm expecting it to say 10 here and I'm expecting it to say 9 here. So this is integer division. Integer division. What they called grade school division. And this is modulus, which means remainder. So that's what I'm expecting to see when I run it. A 1 followed by a 9. So what do you use modulus for? Well, anytime you're interested in the remainder. What's an example of that? Well, say you have 328 pennies, and you want to convert that into a better form of money, right? You want to convert, uh, convert it into dollars and cents, or you want to find out how many quarters there are. So, here's what I could do. I could do int cents is equal to 328, or whatever I did, said, and int a quarter, the value of a quarter, is equal to 25 cents. Now I want to find out how many quarters I have. I'm not actually liking making it a constant like that, I mean a variable. So I'm just going to say int quarters is equal to cents divided by 25. And then what's left over? Pennies is equal to the cents modulus 25. That number's a little bit too large for me to think of, so anyways, I'm gonna change it to 128. How many quarters will 128 give you? Well, 128 divided by 25 is five, right? Five quarters of come out of 128. What's left over? Well, 128 modulus 25 gives you a remainder of three. So after this runs, we should see the cents, the quarters, and the pennies. Let's print that out. System.out.printf percent D, because we're dealing with integers, cents equals percent D quarters and percent D pennies backslash n, end quote, comma. Now let's fill in those variables. I hit return just to get it all on one, I mean, to fit it on the screen. Quarters and pennies. Right, like that. Let's run it and make sure that it works. I'm hoping to see five quarters and three cents out of that. So when I run it, Yep, 128 is equal to 5 quarters and 3 pennies. Now this problem could be made more complicated, right? We could ask for dimes and quarter, excuse me, dimes and nickels and 50 cent pieces and dollars and whatever. But at its most basic, that's a good use for modulus. In order to solve that dimes and quarters business and so on, we would have to just start subtracting money from it, right? Once we figured out the number of quarters, we would multiply cents times 25, and we would get one 
and we would get 125 and we would subtract that from that and then we'd get you know three left but anyways you'd keep removing the amount that you had converted into the lesser type first quarters and dimes and nickels I don't see a reason to give an example of that but let's say that we need to find out you know how many meters and kilometers there are in a far larger amount of kilometers so int Kilometers equals, right, we have 9,876 kilometers. And we just want to convert that to a whole number of kilometers and a whole number of meters. Right. So int k equals kilometers. Kilometers divide, or let's call that km, make it look cool, right? Km is equal to kilometers divided by 1,000. And there's going to be 9 kilometers out of that. That makes sense. I'm sorry I goofed on that. We're converting meters to kilometers, right? So I've run... I'm going to change this completely because I kind of botched that and I don't, want to, I don't want to just fix it. Let's say that we ran for 400 feet and we want to know how many yards and feet that was. So int feet is equal to 400 the yards int yards is equal to that value feet divided by how many feet are there in a yard well it's three three feet per yard and then how many left over after you do that int ft is equal to the feet modulus three that gets the remainder and again, we could print that out if we wanted to. System dot out dot printf parentheses quote percent d for the feet percent d feet equals percent d yards and percent d feet comma. So end quote comma, and after that, we're going to fill in the feet and the yards and the ft. So you may wonder why I used feet and ft here. Well, I did that so I could preserve the original value. Because if I had done feet equals feet modulus 3, then I no longer have that original value of 400. And I wouldn't have been able to print it out here. I forgot to put my backslash in right there. Let's run it. I don't know the answer. I don't know how many feet and yards 400 feet is. We'll find out real soon. 400 feet equals 133 yards and one feet. Well, I would rather have said one foot, right? But I'm not going to put an if statement in there just to change feet to foot. And you can do that to do any kind of straight conversion, like from ounces to pounds and ounces, right? Or from pounds to tons and pounds. It doesn't work if there's a decimal point involved. Like if you're going to convert 200 inches to centimeters. Well, the formula for that is 1 inch equals 2.54 centimeters, and there's a decimal involved. So this modulus business would not work because you can't modulus a decimal in this language. I cannot say something to the effect of double result is equal to 3.4 modulus 7.5 whatever right won't work it's an error oh fine prove me wrong is it going to work well it seems that way so I'm going to change that to 100 divided by 7.5 I wonder what that's going to do let's find out let's print it out system.out.println result What do you know? Learn something new. I forgot that you can do modulus on dissimilar types, right? Not just integers. A lot of languages you can only do it in integers. So when I run it, yeah. 7.5 goes into 100 a certain number of times with 2.5 left over. Well, isn't that wild? 
I don't see much reason to explore that further. I think I'm going to delete that. So operator precedence table. What is the operator precedence table? Do they actually tell us or do they just tell us to look it up? Operator precedence. Maybe you remember from school that multiplication happens before addition. So here's what the operator precedence table looks like. Maybe you've heard the expression PEMDAS, P-M-D-A-S. What does that mean? Parentheses happen before multiplication and division, which happens before addition and subtraction. I'm going to change these to make them shorter to type. Multiply, then divide, and add and subtract. That's the operator precedence table. Multiply and divide, modulus falls into that because it's just another form of division. So we have parentheses, get done first. They force something to get done first, right? Because if I said x is equal to 2 plus parentheses, 3 divided by 4 in parentheses, that would get done first. Once we have figured out what's going to be done first, we figure out that multiplication and division happen before addition and subtraction. Now that doesn't mean that if you have this, x is equal to 3 plus 4 divided by 5 times 6, that you do all the multiplications before you do the divisions. Right? I don't come and divide and multiply that and get 30 and then say 4 divided by 30. Instead, when you're in the same category, you just do them left to right. So regardless of which happens first, the multiplication or the division, left to right, it finds the division first. So it would take 4 divided by 5 and then it would multiply by 6. Same for add and subtract. So this is pretty important stuff because you can calculate in your head expressions and get them wrong. And if you're trying to create an expression and encode it into the program, if you don't use parentheses in the right place to enforce conversions to happen in the right place, to force the math to be done in the proper order, then you're gonna get the wrong answer. The program will get the wrong answer. So here we have this example here. It's a little bit long. I don't know why we had to have this long of an example for our first example. If you've taken fundamentals, and you probably have, you probably already know this stuff. But if I do double R2 for result 2 is equal to 3.5 times 2.0 divided by 3.0. How about 4.0? Just to kind of make it a round number. What gets done first? Multiplication gets done first. I meant to mix our types so that we had addition and subtraction going on. Let's say we had this, right? If we were just going left to right include and thought that it was fine to do that, 3.5 plus 2 is equal to 5. I'm going to round this off even easier. All right, so 3 plus 2 is 5 divided by 4. No, that's not the way it works, right? Because first any parentheses are done. Well, we don't have any parentheses in here, so we can ignore that. Then we do multiply divides, so we would say 2 divided by 4. Well, 2 divided by 4 is 0 0.5. And then finally we can do the add and subtract. I hope that's really clear because if you get formulas and you don't put parentheses in the right place in order to force the addition and subtraction to happen first, if I really did want the addition and subtraction to happen first, I had better put those in parentheses to get them to happen. Now it would work correctly, right? PEMDAS, P-M-D-A-S, parentheses get done first. So whatever's inside the parentheses is the first thing that gets calculated. 3.0 plus 2.0, that equals five and we can divide by four. So if that was the goal, if that's what we needed, great. How about converting Celsius 
Fahrenheit to Celsius, right? So if we had Celsius is equal to, and we wanted to convert 100 degrees Fahrenheit to Celsius, the expression for that is the temperature minus 32 times 1, or divided by 1.8. That's the formula. No, it's not. It's not the formula. Why? Because this is going to happen first, just because division happens before subtraction and addition. But it's not supposed to. If we look up the formula, it's supposed to look like this. Now we know what 100 is in Celsius. 100 minus 32. Well, I'm going to change that to 212 because I happen to know actually the answer to that. 212 is the boiling point of water in Fahrenheit, and it happens to equal exactly 100 in Celsius. That's why Celsius was invented, so that boiling was 100. So 212 minus 32 is 180 minus 1.8, excuse me, divided by 1.8, and 180 divided by 1.8 is in fact 100. That's correct. If we did not have the parentheses here, all would be lost, right? Because it would do that first. 32 divided by 1.8, I don't even know what that is. You know, a little bit more than 4. And then 212 minus 4, this is like 208, right? And we said we wanted it to equal 100, but instead it wound up being equal to 208. Totally wrong. So in order to force that to happen first, we needed our parentheses. And if we Google up our formula, Fahrenheit to Celsius formula, Well, there's all sorts of ways of calculating it, but here's one way. F minus 32 times 5 divided by 9. Well, what's 5 divided by 9? It's just the same thing as dividing by 1.8. It's a different expression of it, but still. You saw that they put the F minus 32 in parentheses to force them to happen first. What about going backwards? Fahrenheit. Well, really, we should have stored this in a variable called f or something, right, to make it easier to read. So double f is equal to 212. And then I could do that, right? I guess I'd already defined f in the past. Didn't remember doing so, but I had. f is already defined once, so I'm going to call it Tf for temperature in F. I'm going to make a note as to what that is. Temperature in F. And I'm going to say Tc for temperature in Celsius is equal to Tf minus 32, and I'll close in parentheses, divided by 1.8. And that's the temp in C. What if we needed to go backwards? What if we had a temperature in C and we wanted to print out the temperature in F? Well, in that case, if the temperature of C is zero and you want to find out what that is in 30 in F, it's 32. Water freezes at zero degrees Celsius. It freezes at 32 degrees F, which is why any temperature below 32 is called below freezing. You don't have to wait until it gets below zero to call it below freezing. Not in America, where we like Fahrenheit. And so the expression is now Tf is equal to 1.8 times temperature of C plus 32. Or we could have put the 32 first. Doesn't matter. Either way works. So that's the formula for converting Celsius to Fahrenheit. And if we try to figure it out, zero. I said it was going to equal 32. So zero times 1.8. Well, zero times anything is zero. And then you add that to 32. So we got the correct answer. All right, so what's our homework going to be? We know how to ask for this stuff, but I don't think our homework has recently asked us to input values. So how about this? Scanner SC equals new scanner with a capital S, parentheses, system.in with a capital S. And we ask the user for a value, system.out.println. 
what is the temp in F question mark and now let's get that input out it's complaining because it doesn't know what a scanner is capital S scanner so I'm going to click on that and say add import for java.util.scanner and then I'm going to scroll up here and just change that to java.util.asterisk in case I need anything else from that library java.util.asterisk now I'm going to scroll back down here we've asked them the question we need to get the result so tf is equal to sc.next double with a capital D and then we could do our equation I'm going to cheat and just copy that right so no 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 that's the wrong equation if I ask for the temperature in F and I want to convert it to C then it needs to be the TC equation so that's wrong delete that go and grab the TC equation TC is equal to that minus that divided by that and we could print the result system dot out dot print F parentheses quote percent F I'm just going to put F for Fahrenheit, right? Or I could spell out the whole word Fahrenheit equals percent F Celsius backslash in, end quote. And after the end quote, comma, the temperature in F and the temperature in Celsius, TFTC. Let's make sure it works. I ought to be able to type in 100 degrees F, no, 212 degrees F and get 100 C. Let's make sure that that's the case. What's the temperature in F? 212. And it does equal 100. run it again to make doubly sure. Here's an annoyance for me. If my cursor is down here and then I press the green arrow, oh, it does, did work. Something nagging at me like at one time it didn't work and you had to have your cursor in the file you were about to compile. But anyways, and then 32 degrees F is equal to 30 is equal to zero degrees Celsius. Now notice this big old long number. Do we really need that many digits of precision? If you looked at a weather report, a weather app, is it going to measure the uh, temperature out to six decimal places? No. We can shorten that. Let's print them out to just two decimal places. So percent dot two F means two digits of precision after the decimal point. Percent dot two F. Now when I run it, the output's going to look a little nicer. Green arrow. What's the temperature in F? It's find out what 77 degrees F is in Celsius. It's equal to 25 Celsius. Is that true? I don't remember. What's the temperature of a human body? About 98.6. And that's equal to 37 degrees Celsius. That sounds right to me. And see, it's displaying it only to two decimal places, so I'm liking that. So what's our homework going to be? Well, the textbook isn't showing us how to use a scanner. But I really hope you can use the scanner. I hope that we've given you enough examples here of how to use the scanner. Although I really only gave you one here, but I know that I've given them to you in the past. Right, haven't I? If you need me to record another lecture about how to use the scanner, ask me. Pretty sure I've done it, but ask me. Right, text me and I'll record another video about the scanner. All you gotta do is print a message asking what the temperature in F is, and then you convert it. Print out the temperature and see. Let's give one more example. I don't have to make a new scanner each time. I just declare it once. So I'm going to ask, what is the number of yards? Right. So system dot out dot print ln parentheses quote. What is the number of yards? Question mark end quote in parentheses semicolon. And then I can read it in. I don't remember if I've made a yards variable or not up here. Yes, I did. Right. And what type is it? It's an integer. 
So I'm going to use next int to read it in. I'm going to redeclare it just for fun, but I'm going to call it yd. Double yd is equal to sc.next double capital D. In parentheses, in parentheses. Now I know the number of yards, and I could do something right. I could calculate the number of feet based on that. Not going to, but you see how to get your next piece of input, right? I can do the same thing over and over, continuing to ask questions. So what's your homework? Well, up here we showed how to use modulus to convert from one data type to another. So what are we going to do? Ask the user for a number of ounces, convert that to pounds and ounces using 16 ounces per pound. If you get stuck for the formula, ask me. I'm going to give you a quick hint. The number of pounds is equal to the number of ounces divided by 16, and the number of ounces left over is equal to ounces of modulus 16, right? Okay, you saw the hint. Unfortunately, for the people who don't watch the videos, they're not going to see that hint because I'm deleting it now. But those are the two formulas, right? So use the scanner to ask for input. Make all your variables double. Okay, that's too easy, right? That's only one. Second part. Ask the user for a temperature in Celsius. If I could spell that would help. And convert it to a temperature in Fahrenheit. Then display the results. Print the results. So ask for the user for a number of ounces, convert that to pounds and ounces using 16 ounces per pound. Then display the results in the form 40 ounces equals 2 pounds and eight ounces. I believe that to be correct. So display the results in the form 100 degrees C equals 212 degrees F. But I'd like for you to display them with the dot zero zero, just like I showed using printf. All right, makes sense. Two tasks to do. Okay, I've gotten several texts recently about what do you upload for your homework? What file do you upload? How do you do it? One thing you really, really, really should enable on your computer if it's not already enabled is the displaying of file extensions. Now the way you get this configured is a little bit different for Windows 10 than it is for Windows 8, Windows 7, whatever. But it's mostly the same. What you gotta do is just open up a Windows Explorer window. And I'm looking for the thing that says options. I'm not seeing it, so I'm gonna go to file. All right, sorry about that. I had to actually review where it was. So when you're viewing a folder like this, click on View, click on Options. I just double clicked on it to get it to work. And then you click on View for Folder Options. And where it says Hide Extensions for Known File Types, you don't want to hide the extensions. Because if you 
hide the extensions, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between a Java file and a dot class file. So you do not want to hide the extensions for known file types. And you can also always change that with the file menu. You can click file, change folder and search options, go to view, and there it is again. Make sure hide extensions for known file types is disabled. All right. You just do that to make it a little bit easier to find the .java file. Okay, so that's what I want you to upload is a .java file. Well, where do I find it? I don't remember where my .java files are stored. I certainly want to though. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to my projects and I'm going to right click on lecture E and I'm going to click properties. And it's going to show me the directory that the project is in. Here's the directory. JG Thompson Documents NetBeans Projects Lecture E. So in order to submit the file, I'm going to go to JG Thompson Documents NetBeans Projects Lecture E. See if I can remember that long enough. I could even keep this on the screen while I'm loading that up. Except in this case, we really want Lecture F, right? that's our newest lecture. I would right click on it, choose properties, go to sources, and it would show me my username, documents, NetBeans, projects, lecture F. There's another way to do this. This is actually maybe a little bit easier. But once you remember where your NetBeans projects folder is, this gets to be pretty easy. You'll stop having to do this properties bit because you will remember. Well, where did it create that directory anyways. Why did it pick that one? Because when I chose file new project, I specified that right here. Project location. Users, JG Thompson documents, NetBeans projects. That's looking pretty familiar, isn't it? So now I want to upload that file. I want to upload my .java file. You're also going to take the screenshot and upload the screenshot. So modules, go to the correct lecture, excuse me, the correct homework, click on it, click submit assignment. Now I'm gonna go find the file. Where was it? It was in my documents folder. It's in a subfolder in my documents folder. Hope I can find my documents folder, hope you can. And it was in a subfolder of it called NetBeans Project. Right there. And then it's in a subfolder of that called lecture F right there you know I have a million of them because I've been using that beans for you know 10 years and then it's in the source directory and you choose that dot Java file so take a look it's in your NetBeans projects your lecture F your source now this may be different for you than it is for me because I forget what the default is that's why you looked it up. That's why you went to properties. After I checked properties, I knew that it was in documents, NetBeans projects, lecture app. Yeah, I'll show you another little way of doing that. Works on the PC at least. I'm gonna come back over here, click on my lecture, choose properties, and I'm gonna actually highlight that, right? And then I can hit control C to copy it. I wish I could right click on it to copy it, but control C should copy it. And then when I'm ready to open my file, I can just paste that here in the file name and it'll take me straight to the source directory. I double click the source directory. If I had a project statement still, it would be in that project name, but it's not, right? Because I took out the project statement. If you don't see your .java file, just double click into the project directory and you'll see it, whatever it was called. And there I found it. That's one way to do it. If that seems hard, there's another way to do it. There's always more than one way to do things with computers. And that's to export it. What you do is you find your project. Just click the project. You choose File, Export to Zip. This works on the Mac, works on the PC, you know, works on anything with NetBeans on it. So we're exporting Lecture F, and then it gives us this path. Now that's a horrible path. We don't want to export our zip to local temp 
we better pick a better directory. So I'm going to click Browse. And notice that when I click Browse, it erases the .zip extension, which is not useful because if you try to upload a file that has no extension, Canvas will probably reject it. I know D2L did. So anyways, I need to pick where to save it. I'm going to click Desktop. I'm going to call it Lecture F, and I might put my initials on it, right? Dot .zip. Very important to hold the zip. Okay, so it's, this zip file is going to be stored in my desktop directory now. The zip file is everything. It's got everything that you could need in order to import that back into NetBeans. And I can open it up and I'll find the .java file. So now that I've done that, and I choose export, it created a zip file which I can find if I open up the desktop folder. So if I go back to my browser and I choose file and I go to my desktop and I find that zip file, there we go. One way works, the other way works, both ways work. If you feel like giving me both the zip file and the .java file, so much the better. Also give me the screenshot and you should be good to go. Hope that explained it. All right, guys, I will see y'all next lecture.